Introductory Neuroscience and Neuroinstrumentation, Electromagnetic Stimulation of the Brain, Lecture 1. Hello, in this session we shall consider electrical stimulation of neuronal cells. Uh, some background first, electrical stimulation of the brain has uh, been the most widely used and sometimes abused technique in the study of brain and behavior. Historically, the first direct electrical stimulation of the brain was demonstrated by Fritz and Hitzig in the 19th century, 1870. They localized the motor area of the cerebral cortex, which you can see uh, below their uh, pictures. Uh, this is the central sulcus and this is the area in front of it. So, it is the motor cortex. And this led ultimately to an understanding of how the motor cortex uh, is organized. So, over the years, electrical stimulation has led to a number of discovery, a uh, number of very, very interesting discoveries and important discoveries in brain function. The most important uh, being that uh, electrical self stimulation, which occurs when uh, you have the electrodes uh, stimulating the pleasure center. Uh, it is also called the median forebrain bundle or the fasciculus medialis tetal encephali. So, here you have a picture of James Olds, a very famous uh, uh, Canadian neuroscientist and here next to uh, uh, him you have the rat and a rat has electrodes implanted into its pleasure center. So, they found uh, this was a serendipitous uh, a discovery, they were not looking for it. They found that uh, the rat would keep self stimulating itself uh, regardless of other stimuli, it would ignore food, it would ignore water. Uh, they even tried drugs like cocaine, it would ignore it and it would keep self stimulating itself literally to death, 7 hours, 24 hours and then it dies of exhaustion. So, this was a very interesting discovery, uh, you know that um, you have a pleasure center and uh, stimulation of the pleasure center overrides all other stimuli. We will come back to it in the last slide. Um, if used properly, electrical stimulation is an extraordinarily useful and powerful technique for dissecting behavioral and neurophysiological mechanisms underlying brain and behavior. So, in 1975, Professor Jane Rank reviewed extracellular stimulation with an emphasis on the principles involved and its practical use. This remains a seminal paper which elements are excited in electrical stimulation of the mammalian central nervous system and uh, I strongly advise you to check it out if uh, you want a more detailed understanding of uh, electrical stimulation. Uh, Jim was also one of my mentors in grad school, uh, head of my program in SUNY Brooklyn. So, his conclusions. So, when current is passed extracellularly, most of the change, voltage change is in the voltage outside the cell. So, we change the transmembrane potential if you remember V a subscript M primarily by changing the voltage outside the cell that is V naught. So, there is a lot of information on the current needed to stimulate a fiber or a cell at a given distance from a monopolar a single electrode over the entire practical interest range of practical interest for intracranial stimulation. Okay. So, some of his conclusions first of all it takes less cathodal current than anodal to stimulate a myelinated fiber passing uh, near a monopolar electrode. The currents from a monopolar cathode, uh, if it is more than 8 times the threshold, it may actually block the action potentials in the axon. Another important point is what is the orientation of the cell body and axons with respect to current flow. And the coverings of the brain, they call the meninges, we have not uh, dealt with them in detail, but one of the coverings is the PA meter and it has significant uh, resistance and capacitance. These coverings are below the bone, uh, the cranium. So, gray matter, white matter and cerebrospinal fluid all have different resistances, resistivities if you will and these affect the patterns of current flow. The fundamental principles of electrical stimulation. So, current delivery is by the stimulation electrode, uh, that is one point. The second point is the electrical properties of neural tissue medium where the current is delivered and finally, the electrode tissue interface. All these parameters are important, uh, you know, when we do electrical stimulation and if you have a good idea of these parameters, then you know, you have successful electrical stimulation. So, the electrical stimulation can either be of constant voltage or constant current. 
So, voltage controlled brain stimulation, uh, here the impedance of the entire circuit dictates the amount of current which flows through it. V, uh, uh, Ohm's law, V equals IR, but here it will be V equals IZ, where Z is the impedance. Uh, on the other hand, you have current constant current stimulators or current control stimulators. These deliver a constant amount of current into the neural tissue with each pulse regardless of the impedance. So, uh, usually we uh, talk of impedance because um, uh, some of the earliest uh, earlier work on electrical stimulation was done with AC uh, stimulators. Typical overall impedance values range from 50, uh, 500 to 1500 ohms. So, assuming a constant impedance of 1K, changing the brain stimulation amplitude by 1 volt changes the brain stimulation current by 1 milliamp, straightforward. So, now let us come to conductivity. So, as its name suggests, this quantifies the ability of the material to conduct electricity and is useful for describing current flow in the brain. So, the brain's conductivity is inhomogeneous and anisotropic and uh, these characteristics have been measured directly in animal models by Charles Nicholson and uh, inferred quantitatively from diffusion tensor imaging of the human brain. So, what is uh, inhomog uh, inhomogeneous and an isotropic? So, inhomogeneity arises from the anatomical differences between different uh, regions like for example, from the white matter versus the gray matter and these cause differences in tissue medium conductivity. Anisotropy is the po a property of being directionally dependent like a vector. Neural tissue uh, exhibits anisotropy because the axons in the white matter they are parallel to one another. So, therefore, the longitudinal conductivity of white matter is greater than the transverse conductivity because of the uh, membranes so on and so forth. So, this is important the conductivity you know of the brain uh, you know is influenced both by the inhomogeneous structure of the brain and the anisotropy of the directional elements. So, so suppose you have a cathode in the extracellular space uh, and uh, you uh, stimulate with cathodic current. So, if you remember the transmembrane potential which is the difference between the intracellular and the extracellular uh, potential, it is usually around uh, minus 70 millivolts. When cathodic stimulation generates negative potentials in the extracellular medium, the intracellular medium is no longer negative, so negative compared to the extracellular medium. So, the membrane is depolarized. If the depolarization is strong enough, then the ionic channel dynamics which we studied in the action potential lectures causes an action potential i.e. the neuron is excited by external cathodic stimulation. So, these studies uh, were done in the cat dorsal column and the cortex by James Rank uh, in 1969 and computational modeling suggests that cathodic stimulation is 4 to 5 times more effective on the average at stimulating axons than anodic stimulation. Now, why is this important? This has practical implications for deep brain stimulation. So, cathodic stimulation deep inside the brain it suppresses tremor for example, Parkinsonic tremor more effectively than anodic stimulation with the same amplitude. Okay. So, <clears throat> what is the current profile when you have a, a cathode or an anode stimulating an axon? Okay. So, on the right you have a cathodic stimulation on the uh, left and ano anodic stimulation on the right these are monopolar electrodes and there is some distant electrode uh, which is not close by which you know allows for the current to return you know um, to the circuit. So, with both uh, kinds of stimuli you get a triphasic pattern of activation like so. Okay. So, this is at amplitude x and then at amplitude 5 x it becomes much more. Okay. So, Jim Rank explained the triphasic pattern of polarization in terms of current flow. So, we shall deal with a cathode uh, 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 cathodic stimulation first. So, consider this uh, the monopolar cathode is next to an axon and um, we uh, you know it draws current you know um, 
through the electrode and this is the triphasic uh, pattern, the profile of current in the axon. Okay. So, the section of the axon closest to the cathode experiences current flow out of the membrane and uh, current flow uh, occurs in the flanking sections inside and so you have this depolarization occurring here and next to it you have hypopolarization. So, these hypopolarized areas uh, flanking the depolarized area are called virtual anodes because it behaves like a virtual anode. The situation is reversed with anodic stimulation. So, you here uh, you have uh, current going into the axon coming out in the flanking regions and you have virtual cathodes on either side of the virtual anode and in this uh, middle it gets hypopolarized. Okay. And again depolarization caused by anodes is usually 4 to 5 times weaker than the primary depolarization caused by cathodic stimuli of the same amplitude. So, so uh, you have this concept uh, of an activating function which is uh, you know uh, first uh, shown by Rattay in 1986. So, the activating function is the second spatial derivative of the extracellular potentials uh, in the direction of the axon. So, this is the voltage, this is the uh, voltage um, uh, being induced. This dotted line over here is the first spatial derivative and the solid line here is the second spatial derivative. Okay. This concept comes again in neurophysiology with current source density um, analysis which shows the sources and sinks. So, the activating function depends on myelination. So, if there is no myelin the activating function is it is a continuous function. But if it is myelinated uh, remember uh, you have uh, the action potential occurring at the nodes of Ranvier because of saltatory function. So, here it is a discrete function because the potentials only at the nodes of Ranvier matter. For non myelinated axons there is there are no nodes of Ranvier so it is a continuous function. Okay. So, what are the uh, when you uh, give a stimulus uh, when you use electrical stimulation of neurons uh, they have to be charge balanced because if they are not uh, there would be electrode degradation and tissue damage at the electrodes and biphasic stimulation waveforms help uh, in preventing charge accumulation on the electrode. So, depending on the stimulus waveform uh, shape you can uh, selectively stimulate specific neuronal elements more uh, easily than other neuronal elements. In 1975 Jim Rang survived the available evidence and suggested that even during stimulation near an axon soma the axon including the initial segment which we considered previously is stimulated. And recently computational modeling studies also support the fact the site of the action potential initiation is always the axon or the initial uh, segment rather than the cell body or soma. Okay. Uh, this is because you know um, uh, the initial segment uh, is easier to excite because of the preponderance of voltage gated sodium channels. So, uh, there are, uh, when you stimulate uh, you know uh, neural elements and axons uh, there are two uh, definite populations which can be stimulated. So, one are axons of passage they arise from distant cell groups they just happen to be close to the stimulating electrode. Local projection axons on the other hand they come from the cell bodies in the vicinity of the electrode. So, when you these axons are stimulated the effect is the same as when the action potential is initiated in the cell body. So, monophasic anodic pulses activate a greater proportion of local projection axons. Uh, conversely, monophasic cathodal pulses activate a greater proportion of axons of passage. Okay. So, what are the considerations efficiency considerations for electrical stimulation? So, the shape of the stimulation waveform affects the charge, the power and energy efficiency of stimulation. So, charge efficient waveforms are desirable because there is less tissue damage uh, related to the amount of charge injected. Power efficiency, the amount of power a stimulator needs to deliver uh, dictates the battery size with higher power requiring a larger battery. Uh, 
Then energy efficiency. So the more energy efficient a waveform is, it can prolong the life of an implantable pulse generator. These generators uh, are implanted in the brain uh, for deep brain stimulation, Parkinson's uh, and a few other diseases. And these IPG lifetime is correlated linearly with energy consumption. If it's inefficient, then you have to replace it every few months. Uh, and if it's efficient, it can go on for years. Okay. So, monopolar simulation. Uh, so far, we have just considered monopolar simulation and uh, that is a single uh, electrode close to the neuronal elements and uh, monopolar deep brain stimulation is applied by allowing the device's metal case implanted in the chest to act as a return electrode. So, you have the electrode in the brain and then you have a device which is implanted somewhere in your chest and the chassis of the, you know, uh, uh, device. Uh, that acts as a return electrode. It is considered an infinite distance away from the neuronal elements here as opposed to here and therefore uh, this electrode would be considered monopolar. The electrodes can also be configured for bipolar stimulation with two or more elect electrodes of opposite polarities uh, in the brain or close to each other. So it is assumed, I mean just by uh, intuition uh, that bipolar stimulation is more focused than monopolar stimulation because the current flow is steered by the electrode of opposite polarity. So while the profile of polarization is more complex for bipolar stimulation, computational models suggest that the volume of tissue activated is not that much different from monopolar stimulation. However, one major advantage of uh, uh, you know, uh, bipolar uh, deep brain stimulation is that you decrease uh, the stimulus artifact and therefore you can sim simultaneously record ECG and EEG. <coughs> okay. So what about how far should the electrode be from uh, uh, the uh, site of interest? So as extra pol uh, pot uh, extracellular potentials decline with distance from a source, the current needed to excite an electron depends on the distance of the axon from the stimulating source. So this equation for threshold current as a function of distance from the electrode is of the following form uh, I uh, R is equal to I node plus K R squared where R is the distance between the electrode and the axon and I node and K are constants. So if you look at the graph uh, on the right as the electrode moves away from the axon the threshold current increases with the square of the distance, okay. It is non-linear. So the parameter k controls how quickly the threshold current increases as the electrode is moved away from the axon and k depends on the diameter, axonal diameter. So for an axon of a given distance from an electrode, the greater its conduction velocity, the less the current needed to stimulate it. Now we know that conduction velocity is directly proportional to axon diameter. Therefore, large diameter axons are more easily stimulated than small diameter axons. Okay. So now we get into strength duration relationships. So the minimum stimulus amplitude required to excite an axon at a given distance from a stimulating electrode depends on the duration. It also depends on the magnitude but also on the duration of the stimulation pulse. So the threshold. So this is, uh, these concepts were first, uh, you know, uh, put on the table by Lapique, a, a French neurophysiologist. So Rio base is a threshold. The Rio base current is defined as a threshold current for infinitely long pulses. So an infinitely long pulse and this is uh, the threshold current, IRH is the Rio base current. Chronaxi is defined as the pulse duration required for excitation when the amplitude of the current is equal to twice Rio base. So twice of this and this is the pulse width. Uh, these uh, uh, parameters were further uh, amplified and studied in detail by W. H. Rushton, uh, FRS Physiological Society. And why is it important? So clinicians, you know, when we uh, stimulate, when clinicians stimulate, the brain uh, with uh, you know for Parkinson's they use uh, deep brain uh, stimulus parameters. Stimulation is most energy efficient when the pulse width is equal to the chronaxi i.e. an IPG an implantable pulse generator will last the longest uh, 
when the pulse width is equal to the chronaxia of the stimulated neurons. So, from Jim Rong's data, axon chronaxia, uh, chronaxes are 30 to 200 microseconds for large myelinated fibers and 200 to 700 microseconds for small myelinated fibers. Uh, therefore, rational exists for the typical range of deep brain uh, uh, stimulation pulse widths of 60 to 150. So, finally, how is it important? Uh, one is it is important for deep brain stimulation, but also you can make a rat cyborg and this was first uh, shown uh, by Talwar uh, uh, et al uh, from SUNY Brooklyn and the group is headed by uh, John Shapin and uh, in 2002 what they did was they put different electrodes in the rat's brain and the rat uh, you know it moves its way uh, through uh, you know the environment using its whiskers, the whiskers sense obstacles ok. So, when it feels an obstacle on this side it moves the other side and when it feels an obstacle over here it moves this side. So, uh, what we do is since the brain is contralaterally represented the whiskers over here are represented this side on this hemisphere. So, we put an electrode over here and when we stimulate it over here the rat feels an obstruction and moves this side and likewise over here and we can make it move. Now, why should it move? Remember uh, uh, Olds, James Olds uh, earlier on this lecture. So, when you couple this to the pleasure center and then you can control this movement. So, if it moves this side uh, with stimulation appropriate stimulation and it moves uh, correctly you stimulate its pleasure center. Now, the pleasure center is the ultimate pleasure uh, you know and a mammal can get it overrides everything you know uh, better than food, better than sex, better than drugs much much more. Uh, so, uh, it is compelled to do it and what they did was they showed it. So, uh, over here you have the two uh, somatosensory cortical areas which uh, steers the rat by mimicking sensations left and right and it you get this pleasure centers over here uh, MFB medial forebrain bundle and this is the reward th uh, center. So, if the rat moves uh, the way it is supposed to then it gets a shot of pleasure ok. So, these are the actual commands. So, for starting we just stimulate the uh, pleasure center and starts moving for the left we stimulate the left somatosensory cortex. So, it feels something on the right and moves away and likewise for the right and also there is an area called the periaqueductal gray matter which was actually found by a Chinese scientists and if you uh, stimulate that area the rat freezes and comes to a full stop. Now, you might ask what happens if you overstimulate the pleasure center what does the rat do? Well, it starts circling it goes round and round and round ok. So, thank you in the next lecture we shall consider transcranial direct current stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation and electroconvulsive therapy.